My topic is uh, market failure mythology, and I'm passing around. I've put together, a, I don't know, about 15 or so uh, articles uh, on this whole topic, market failure mythology, uh, that have been published. You know, I think the first one is 1969 by Harold Demsetz. And so if you're interested in this topic, I thought this would be a, a good way to follow up. And, and so, uh, you know, in the around the 1950s and 60s, the economics profession sort of exploded with theories of, of uh, market failure. And which is why, by the way, my old professors, James Buchanan and Gordon, Gordon Tullock, my graduate school uh, professors, uh, invented the field of public choice as sort of a counter to the market failure revolution in economics. And uh, one of the things that distinguishes the Austrian school from the public choice school is the Aust Austrians never bought into the fact that uh, of all this market failure literature. Whereas the public choice school, for the most part, says, okay, even if we accept all this, uh, governments fail also. And so the, the, the method of analysis in public choice economics is sort of a, they call it a comparative institutional analysis. The, comparative failures, a study of comparative failures, a study of imperfect markets and imperfect governments. But uh, the Austrians never bought into the imperfect markets thing like uh, story like um, the public choice school has, uh, which is not to say that uh, you shouldn't study public choice economics. That's, you know, that's my background is partly in there. But I, I wrote down what I think are five, I'm gonna talk about some of this literature and I just wrote down what I think are five uh, reasons, or five themes, really, that run through this literature that explain why so much of the literature on markets that says markets fail uh, say this. And one is called the nirvana fallacy. And that's a, a phrase coined by Harold Demsetz in the first article at the top of this uh, list of literature that I'm handing out. Uh, is a 1969 article called Information and Efficiency, Another Viewpoint. And basically the nirvana fallacy, Peter Klein might have mentioned this. Does anyone, does it ring a bell? Did Peter Klein mention this? Uh, yeah. uh, well, anyway, it's comparing the real world to an unachievable utopian ideal, like perfect competition, for example. And of course, if you compare the real world to an unachievable utopian ideal, the real world is always imperfect or failing, <clears throat> as far as that goes. And, it's, and Harold Dempsey's called that the nirvana fallacy. The second reason is uh, the failure to view markets like the Austrians do as dynamic, rivalrous, a, a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurial discovery. Uh, and competition is never ending, it's, it's ongoing. Whereas uh, beginning around the 1930s, the economics profession uh, abandoned the Austrian view of competition. Anybody who wrote on competition from Adam Smith, even before Adam Smith, on until about the 1930s, described competition more or less like the Austrians do, as I just said, dynamic rivalrous process of entrepreneurial discovery. Uh, whereas it was, but that was difficult at the time to model mathematically. And it still is. And so in order to uh, appear to be scientific, the, uh, the budding mathematical revolution in economics adopted a static model of competition that was more amenable to mathematical manipulation and model building. That's the perfect competition model. And so, uh, so the way in which uh, the economics profession started looking at markets changed. And all of a sudden, markets were failing everywhere. Because after all, if you look at the new definition of competition, it was no longer rivalry, <clears throat> uh, it's no longer dynamic. It was many firms, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, costless entry and exit, and perfect information. And that was the new definition of competition. And of course, that's total. That's a that's nirvana. Uh, even the simplest thing. Look at the many firms assumption that was made. What if you had an industry with, say, 50 competing firms and 10 of them are producing lower quality and higher price products than the rest? And as a result, the consumers wisely choose not to purchase those products. Well, you then you go from 50 to 40. So you have fewer firms uh, and that's supposed to be a bad thing. But of course, if you look at uh, the real world of competition, that's a good thing. 
It's a good thing that consumers are in charge and they chose not to buy the crap, high-priced crap from these 10, 10 businesses. But the new model of competition uh, said that we should be suspicious of this, that there is the industrial concentration is occurring and, uh, and, and so and it lead, may lead to monopoly. Uh, the perfect information assumption. Uh, uh, what is that? Well, ignoring elementary economics. Uh, there's no such thing as perfect information. It, it, it would be, in other words, another way of saying that is uh, we don't believe that scarcity exists. That uh, if, there's, if information is costless to acquire, well, then there's no scarcity. And if there's no scarcity, there's no study of economics. Uh, you know, what, what are you studying uh, if there's no scarcity uh, out there? And so they ignore that, ignoring elementary economics, ignoring reality and history. I'm going to talk about some of these studies where economists just uh, assert uh, a market failure story and without, ever, without ever getting up out of their swivel chair in their academic office and looking outside to see if reality has anything at all to do with their story. And, and, then, and I'm going to quote Nobel Prize winners as, as saying these things. Uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, Professor uh, Smith from Podunk University. Uh, the fifth thing, no role for entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, markets are imperfect because human beings are imperfect. And uh, if we have problems, uh, well, another way of looking at it, e economic problems is, uh, uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective, is, well, is there money, is there money to be made in solving this problem? And there often is in the literature on market failure. And so uh, a lot of this literature ignores the fact that entrepreneurs, you know, if there's money to be made in solving a problem, they're going to go after it. They're going to they're gonna solve that problem. Uh, it reminds me of uh, when, when I lived in Tennessee many years ago, I uh, befriended a, an elderly gentleman who was a retired, uh, cons uh, he owned a construction company. And, and he, he would, we would get together for lunch about once a month because he wanted to talk economics, and uh, he had a degree in agricultural economics from like 1920 or years ancient history. This is the late 1980s I'm talking about, and so he and uh, and he uh, uh, he he said that you know if as sure as if there's a there's a crack in my driveway, it is a certainty that grass will grow out of there. You won't see any dirt or anything. There's a little crack in my driveway like this. Grass is going to grow there. He said as sure as that's going to happen. If there's a dollar to be made, some entrepreneur is going to make that dollar somehow, some way. And but the economics literature largely ignores all this, all these things. And if you if you get into this literature that's on these the uh, the list that I handed out, uh, these are themes that I see running through all of this literature of why uh, markets are said to fail. So so what is this literature? Um, well, the Nirvana fallacy. The first exa example of the Nirvana fallacy, the article that Demsetz wrote, that's the first one, on, and De Harold Demsetz was a UCLA economics professor for many years, and if you ever get into the literature of Harold Demsetz, it's very Austrian sounding. He never called himself an Austrian, but even when I was in graduate school and first got uh, exposed to this, that when I was reading uh, the works of Harold Demsetz from my stone tablets back in those days, you know, we had to carry very big knapsacks in those days with students uh, with stone tablets. It was very Austrian. It was, it was very, you know, it, it sounded a lot like Israel Kirzner and, uh, and Mises were talking about entrepreneurship. But he, he was a Chicago school guy, though, and he never, never admitted that. But he talks about this. And, uh, you know, in, he was in a debate with Kenneth Arrow, the Nobel Prize winning economist, Kenneth Arrow, over the effects of innovation, technological innovation. And uh, <clears throat> Arrow basically, you know, he, he wrote these articles that had uh, hundreds of equations in them. It came to the conclusion that markets fail when it comes to innovation uh, in, a, in a number of ways. <clears throat> and one way in which the markets fail is that innovation creates monopoly. And of course, we, uh, you know, the standard mainstream story of monopoly is that it restricts output and causes uh, deadweight losses and, and various other evils. And what Demsetz basically said is, well, here's what uh, Kenneth Arrow is saying. This is the textbook monopoly diagram with a constant cost industry. Kenneth Arrow is saying if somebody invents an, a new product or service that no one else has, you went from zero. Here's quantity zero here where my finger, here the pen is. 
And, uh, but here's the monopoly, and you're creating your monopoly, at least temporarily. So this is the amount of output, QM, okay? And so that's said to be a market failure because you're creating monopolies through innovation. I know to an ordinary man on the street, this must sound crazy, but this was Nobel Prize winner Kenneth Arrow. Uh, but uh, Demsetz merely pointed out that, well, what he's saying here is that if, say, 100 people magically had the same idea instantaneously at the same time, then you would get the Nirvana output. This would be the competitive level of output right here because the marginal cost curve would be the supply curve and here's a demand curve. So that's, that would be QC here would be the, the level of output. And that would be the Nirvana level of output. If everybody had this, this, the same light bulb went off in 100 mines at the same time and they all invented the same product, perfect competition would prevail. And so uh, Dem says, basically says the real, the real comparison should be Yesterday, we had none of this, with zero. Today, we have some. Output has expanded. Therefore, consumer welfare has expanded and profits have expanded. Somebody's made some money. It's all good. It's, the market has succeeded. And so, but what Arrow is doing is comparing the real world, QM, to the unachievable utopian ideal of QC. And that's the Nirvana fallacy. And so, and the Demsetz article is much longer than what I just said. It tells, says a lot more than just this. But that's basically uh, the, the debate that he was getting into with Kenneth Arrow over innovation. And uh, at, one, at one point in my career, I, I reviewed a book for the Southern Economic Journal. It was on innovation, the economics of technological innovation. And in one chapter had 69 equations in it. And the concluding sentence of the chapter was that uh, after, this, after going through this whole big long model with 69 equations, the author concluded that the more profitable is an investment, the more likely it is that uh, entrepreneurs will put money into it. <laughs> it's, I'm not making this up. That's the kind of literature you sometimes run into in the economics profession. It's like, you know, I went to school for this, uh, uh, to learn this. Uh, 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 I would be uh, embarrassed as a fraud if I stood up in front of students and pretended that this was some big, you know, revelation. Uh, so let me get let me get into some other literature. Uh, uh, Ronald Coase wrote some interesting articles about this, and Coase was another economist that that a lot of what things he wrote are not necessarily the Coase theorem. I know uh, Walter Block and Joe Salerno and others have criticized Coase theorem, but other things Coase has written. On, in the field of industrial organization, uh, are pretty would be pretty consistent with the Austrian method of analysis. And, and uh, one thing he did, he wrote this famous article called "The Lighthouse in Economics." And uh, because at, at the time, you know, if, if you took an economics course, principles of economics in the 1950s and 60s and the 70s, when you get to the chapter on public goods and the free rider problem. Uh, an example that was given in almost all the books, especially in Paul Samuelson's book, which was by far the biggest seller, was lighthouses, uh, a public good. You know, once once the light is out there, it's a, it's a, it's uh, impossible to to uh, exclude anybody from it, and it's also said to be difficult, if not impossible, to force anybody to pay for it, because the light is already out there, and therefore there'll be free riders in a free rider problem, and you'll never be able to raise enough money uh, privately. To have lighthouses. And uh, for example, here's what uh, Samuelson himself said. Here is a later example of a government service's lighthouses. These save lives and cargoes, but lighthouse keepers cannot reach out to collect fees from, ship, from skippers, boat captains. So uh, we have here a divergence between private advantage and money cost and true social advantage and cost. Uh, um, let's see as measured by lives and cargo saved in comparison with one, total cost of the lighthouse, and two, extra costs that result from letting one more ship look at the warning light. Philosophers and statesmen have always recognized the necessary role of government in such cases of external economy divergence between private and social advantage. Okay, that's a mouthful. And so, so, so Samuelson has taught generations of students. You know, Samuelson's book was first published in 1948, and it was by far the best-selling principles of economics book for 40 years. And most of the other books in the market during this time were clones of Samuelson. Uh, 
I remember uh, once uh, seeing there was a very bad book by uh, a guy named Campbell that was, uh, that was just as bad as Samuelson's book, but uh, it, it was the second biggest seller for for all those years. Okay, so that's what what he says. Now, what, so what did Coase do? Coase did something that Paul Samuelson, the MIT math, math, mathematician, did not do. He got off his butt and went to the library and studied the lighthouse industry, the history of the lighthouse business out there. And basically what he found is that in England, uh, which is where, you know, his Brit coast was British, that uh, for generations, private merchants had funded, privately funded lighthouses because it was in their interest to do so. Uh, they didn't want to lose their cargo on the rocks. They didn't want to ship, have a shipment from America arrive in England and crash in a storm. Uh, that, that, that's the origins of the insurance industry, by the way, that, that sort of thing. But also, you know, uh, that's, uh, lighthouses are a form of insurance against that sort of calamity of your shipwrecking after crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And so he found that uh, they were privately financed until the, the British government stepped in and took over and monopolized the lighthouses. And, uh, but Samuelson obviously knew nothing about that. And here's what something that Coase said about this. He says, the question remains, how is it that these great men, he's referring to Samuelson and a few others that he quotes, have in their economic writings been led to make statements about lighthouses which are as misleading as to the facts, whose meaning, if thought about in a concrete fashion, is quite unclear, and which to the extent that they imply a policy conclusion are very likely wrong. And, and he basically says, what I just said, they never left their faculty offices. They never did the hard work of actually uh, uh, studying lighthouses, and, and they didn't. And so Coase, in that article that was published in the Journal of Law and Economics, uh, debunked the lighthouse uh, theory. And another, um, another uh, well-known theory, I think Bob Murphy mentioned this briefly uh, in his talk uh, this morning, is uh, roads, uh, private roads, and, and, the, and, and there's said to be a free rider problem there. Uh, in my book, Hamilton's Curse, I, I, I talked about how Alexander Hamilton himself, America's first treasury secretary, articulated a version of the free rider problem to make the case for government subsidies for road building and canal building. And so this, this argue, is a very long argument. Uh, but uh, uh, what Bob this morning uh, referred to this in his talk on uh, the stateless society, but he, I don't think he didn't mention the uh, article. The article that he, that he was referring to, I, I recognize the language that he was saying, is the one that's on my list that I handed out by Daniel Klein in Economic Inquiry. And, uh, and Klein did the same kind of thing that Ronald Coase did, and that uh, he looked at these theories. Yeah, what's well, plausible? There's a free rider problem, and People will not invest sufficiently to build roads because you can make the case that roads are a public good. And so he studied the early road building in early America from the year 1800 and the next several decades. And here's what Daniel Klein found. He said, the, the private road building movement built new roads at rates previously unheard of in America. Over $11 million was invested in turnpikes, they were called turnpikes, in New York, 6.5 million in New England, over four and a half million dollars in Pennsylvania. Between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies were built and operated about 3,750 miles of road. New York led all of their states in turnpike mileage with over 4,000. He talks about New Jersey, Ohio, and other places. So there was, there was a lot of privately funded road building that went on. Then he goes on to explain how this happened in that uh, yeah, the, the rate of return to investment in these turnpike companies was only about 3 or 4%, whereas you could have made 10% elsewhere back in that, at that time, Daniel Klein says. So why did they invest? Why did these people invest? Well, the merchants in these towns understood that if they, they had a road that connected their town to, uh, to, a, uh, to, to other towns, there would be more business. And so, uh, you know, they were entrepreneurial about it. They, they, they weren't that stupid. Like, like the, the old man that I talked to, my old friend in Tennessee, if there's a dollar to be made, some entrepreneur is going to find a way to make it. And so uh, this doesn't take much of an act of genius to realize if we have more people shopping, then we might make more sales. And so they invested. And there was also a lot of social ostracism. If you were a merchant and you, and you tried to, and you were a free rider, 
people wouldn't do business with you, they wouldn't socialize with you and so forth. So they used social ostracism to get their, their neighbors and other people in their communities to invest in the turnpike uh, companies, and it worked. Uh, Daniel Klein quotes uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, his famous book, Democracy in America, in, uh, in talking about how one of the unique things he noticed about Americans was all these voluntary associations they had, including voluntary associations that were set up to, uh, to motivate people to build roads. And so, the, and so the, the free rider problem is often overcome by efforts like this, but you have, to, you have to think dynamic. You have to think of competition being a dynamic and not a static thing. You have to think of uh, uh, entrepreneurship playing a role here, and, that, and that's what happens. And so that's the private road story. Uh, another, another, of my, uh, another classic article in this literature is by Stephen Chung. Uh, Stephen Chung was an uh, uh, economics professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, and he wrote an article, it's on my list here, called The Fable of the Bees. And has anybody here ever heard of this, The Fable of the Bees? Nobody, maybe one person, okay. okay. Maybe you heard of The Fable of the Bees, but not Stephen Chung, I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, the same sort of thing was going on in that uh, there was, in some of the textbooks, uh, there was, in the, when you get to the section on externalities, a story that was told is that, well, here's a case of externality problem that requires government intervention. What if you had uh, uh, beekeepers and apple orchards in the same vicinity? Well, if the bees pollinate the apple orchards, uh, they create a positive externality for the, bee for the apple orchard owner because they pollinate the trees and the trees create more apples. And at the same time, the apple trees provide nourishment for the bees so the beekeeper will get more honey. However, uh, there there's, doesn't seem to be any mechanism that would cause the beekeepers to want to locate their hives next to apple orchards. Uh, and, and, so, and so the apple orchard owners and the beekeepers just forego this, this big profit opportunity. Uh, therefore, we should subsidize beekeeping and maybe centrally plan the whole beekeeping apple orchard uh, business. And uh, here's another Nobel laureate, James Mead, that, he, that Stephen Chung quoted. Uh, he says this, Suppose that in a given region there's a certain amount of apple growing and a certain amount of beekeeping, and that the bees feed on the apple blossoms. If the apple farmers apply 10% more labor, land, and capital to apple farming, they will increase the output of apples by 10%. But they will also provide more food for the bees. On the other hand, the beekeepers will not increase the output of honey by 10% by increasing the amount of land, labor, and capital to beekeeping by 10%, unless at the same time the apple farmers also increase their output and so the food, and so therefore the food of the bees, by 10%. We call this a case of unpaid factor, an unpaid factor because the situation is due simply and solely to the fact that the apple farmer cannot charge the beekeeper for the bees' food. So the bees are free riding, you know, they can't charge the beekeeper for the bees' food, namely the, uh, the apple blossoms. And so James Mead went on to say, you know, once again, we need, uh, we need regulation. We need the government to step in here and micromanage the beekeepers. Well, Stephen Chung did the unheard of. Once again, he got up off his butt and started researching the apple industry. He's in Washington State, after all. If you went, if you went to the nearest grocery store in Auburn right now and bought apples, it, you'd sign a whole bunch of them from Washington State, a big apple-growing place. And lo and behold, what he found is that for, for many generations, the beekeepers and the apple orchard owners had this all figured out, that they had written contracts between the apple orchard owners and the beekeepers. Uh, they, they were so minute in detail that they would even say things like, uh, the apple orchard owner is to notify the beekeepers two weeks in advance when they're going to spray pesticides on the apples so they don't harm the bees. And, and the, the monetary compensation was all written out and so forth. And so, so once again, if you, and, and the assumption that people like J.E. Mead made is basically uh, entrepreneur, there's no such thing as entrepreneurship. And, and that business people, that, you know, they might condemn profits, greedy, profit-seeking capitalists, while at the same time arguing that these greedy, profit-seeking capitalists uh, just walk around with their heads in the clouds 
and there's like, it's as though there's $10,000 in cash sitting in front of me and I just walk right past it and don't pay any, any attention to it uh, at all. And so, but it didn't take Stephen Chung much to discover that this, this is false. And I'll read you one quick quote from him. But, but these, he says, contracts, here's what he found. Contracts between beekeepers and farmers may be oral or written. I have at hand two types of written contracts. One is formally printed by an association of beekeepers. So their trade association actually had model contracts for the, bee, for the beekeepers to you. You'd have to make up your own contract. Another is designed for specific beekeepers with a few printed headings and space for stipulations to be filled in by hand. Aside from situations where a third party demands documented proof of the contract, written contracts are used primarily for the initial arrangement between the parties, otherwise oral arrangements are made. And so, and so they're very detailed. And so, and so once again, the, the problem, there was money to be made. Yeah, there's an external, positive externality issue here in the language of economics. But these entrepreneurs figured this out a long time ago. And it's, it's James Mead who had his head in the clouds, not the beekeepers and the apple orchard owners. Um, the next example, market failure mythology, uh, it rhymes with Fable of the Bees. It's called Fable of the Keys. And um, you all recognize this. Yeah. Don't you? What is that? That's uh, the keyboard on a, a computer or, or a, a typewriter. I actually wrote my doctoral dissertation on a typewriter. It, it was, they had just gotten rid of the stone tablets and the typewriters came in. <laughs> And the, but the, I don't think anybody here, except for Dr. Prince, knows what a typewriter is, besides me. And, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, there's an economist named Paul David. He used to be at the University of Tennessee. I kind of lost track of him. I don't know if he's retired now or if he's still around at Tennessee. But uh, he published uh, a couple of articles uh, in which he argued that uh, well, markets sometimes fail by locking in inferior technology. And uh, Exhibit A in this one article of his, is very widely cited, was the QWERTY keyboard. Because there's a different type of keyboard uh, that goes by this name, Dvorak. It's a Czech name. Uh, I gave a talk at uh, the Prague School of Economics several years ago about this. And, and I mentioned that, and the students all laughed. Uh, you know, I, I read Dvorak there because it's a Czech. I don't know why they were so funny. It's a, he was, a, he was an American, but he's from Czech, former Czechoslovakia. He was an immigrant. And um, I never got why. They thought it was funny. That it but anyway, uh, uh, Paul David made the argument in this, this article that the Dvorak keyboard was uh, superior to the QWERTY keyboard, even though consumers, stupid consumers, somehow chose to buy typewriters back in those days uh, with the QWERTY keyboard, and, and that pretty much locked in the QWERTY keyboard, because everybody had, that's what everybody had. And so, but he, and he cited these studies from the U.S. Navy that it supposed, this did, that supposedly proved the superiority of the Dvorak keyboard over the QWERTY keyboard. And so the, he used that as his exhibit for uh, uh, market failure, an exhibit A for market failure. And then along comes uh, some other economists, Steve Margolis is one of them. And so let me see get the right page number here. Oops. Stan Leibowitz and Steve Margolis came along and they were skeptical of this. They were just like Ronald Coase was skeptical of the lighthouse story and Stephen Chung was skeptical of the apple, oh, apple orchard and the bees story, and they looked into it. And here's what they found. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Anyway, they looked, they found, they dug up these Navy, United States Navy studies done during World War II uh, that, that were being cited as proof of a market failure. And they say, all of these studies suspiciously seem to be in favor of the Dvorak design, all of them, every, every one of them. And then uh, they say this, <clears throat> there's a man named Earl Strong, a professor at Pennsylvania State University and one, one time chairman of the office machine section of the American Standards Association, reports that the 1944 Navy experiment 
and some Treasury Department experiments performed in 1946 were conducted by a Dr. Dvorak who owned the patent on the Dvorak keyboard. And so, and so Dvorak was a naval officer who had a patent on his keyboard and he did the studies. That's kind of like Ford Motor Company claiming to have done studies comparing Fords to General Motor cars and concluding that Fords are superior to General, General Motors cars. Who would believe that? Paul David would, I, I assume. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people who are, you know, they locked in inferior automobiles. Uh, you know. And so, so this, you know, this doesn't prove that the Dvorak keyboard was inf not superior, but it should, you know, raise some suspicions over, over this. And so, uh, so anyway, they, they did, the Margolis and Leibowitz commissioned their own studies of this, and they basically concluded that uh, the two keyboards are not that different, uh, but for whatever reason, the consumers just liked the QWERTY better. It must have been marginally better, marginally more convenient for typing, and so that prevailed. And so, uh, and there wasn't that much of a difference, even if you thought the Dvorak keyboard uh, was superior, there apparently wasn't that much of a difference that very many people were willing to relearn how to type on the different keyboard in order to make it uh, more viable. And so that, that story also went uh, by the wayside. Uh, so another story similar to this one was, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, maybe uh, only a few people in this room remember what a VCR is, uh, video, uh, <laughs> video uh, recorders in the early days of uh, uh, home movies. But there were two different types, a beta and a VHS, of these machines. And uh, a lot of people started saying, well, the, the beta, beta is superior technology. Beta is superior. Consumers uh, disagreed. And eventually, the beta version of the machine just disappeared. You know, nobody, nobody would buy it. But all the experts were saying that's the superior technology. And you had economists saying the same thing, that uh, the market failure that's locking in an inferior technology. But the consumers you know, by the millions. Uh, I remember back in these days, a lot in the, uh, going into a, when we back when we used to rent movies from Blockbuster, go and they used to divide the movies into the, the VHS section over here and the beta section over here. And I remember going into one of these shops, and the VH section had like like it looked like the, the library here. There's so all these movies, and then the the beta section was like this. It was like, it was like three movies. You know, you want you know, that was about it because they've just gone out of business. And so that was, that was yet another, another uh, myth about market failure uh, that, that is out there. Okay, and it, and it falls into, you know, what, you know, one or more of these categories seemed, always seem to be the explanation for, for why these economists come up with these, uh, these myths. Uh, another myth that I've written about, I wrote an article that was published in the... Uh, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics some years ago called The Myth of Natural Monopoly. It's on the reading list there. It's online. You, you can read it. And I was always a little suspicious of this story about natural monopoly. You know, I was an economics student as an undergraduate, like a lot of you are, and went to graduate school, you know, became a professor. And they had heard this story forever. The basic story is that in the late 19th, early 20th century, in industries, uh, uh, with heavy fixed costs like telephone, electricity, water supply, natural gas, uh, you had a situation where one large company was achieving economies of scale and was, was therefore uh, able to underprice everybody and it became a natural monopoly. They were becoming a natural monopoly. That's where the phrase natural meaning free market, basically a monopoly. And, uh, and so uh, that's the basic story. And, so, and the second part of the basic story is that Therefore, uh, government came to the rescue, and what the government did was to create legal monopolies, you know, they, because they said, well, we want the economies of scale, it's a good thing, low cost, but we don't want monopoly prices, so we will come in and create monopolies, and then we, what we will do is we'll regulate the price so that they'll make a profit, but not a monopoly profit, and so that's what, that's what rate regulation is supposedly about electric power, rate regulation, natural gas, and so forth. But Harold Demsetz again uh, did the unthinkable, at least the unthinkable. If you're from MIT or Harvard or one of these market, the, the one of these places, the market failure capital of North America, you know, 
the, the, the Ivy League schools where, where a lot of this comes from. He did the unthinkable and once again got off his butt, and left his swivel chair at his UCLA office and went to the library. Uh, this was before all human knowledge was on the internet. And the, well, you actually had to go to a library to dig this stuff up. And here's what he found about this era of history, late 19th, early 20th century, was what was going on. Six electric light companies were organized in one year of 1887 in New York City. 45 electric light companies had the legal right to operate in Chicago in 1907. Prior to 1895, Duluth, Minnesota was served by five electric lighting companies. Scranton, Pennsylvania had four in 1906. During the latter part of the 19th century, competition was the usual situation in the gas industry in this country, meaning natural gas. Before 1884, six competing companies were operating in New York City. Competition was common and especially persistent in the telephone industry. Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Detroit, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis had at least two telephone companies in 1905. So he demonstrated that this story never happened. There never was this one big monopoly created on the free market. There was vigorous competition. But so how did we get monopolies in the, 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 uh, the public utilities in the United States? Well, I, I myself did the unthinkable and got off my butt and left my faculty office and, uh, years ago. And I went uh, to the Johns Hopkins Library, which is right down the street from where my office is at Loyola University. You know, they're sort of side by side there. And, uh, and so, uh, and I, in the, you know, well, this was bef before everyone was online on the internet. And, uh, and I always, you know, when I started my career, I enjoyed digging through libraries. I was, went to do my research uh, because it gave me an edge. Because as, as I keep saying to you, most economists, including, especially these Nobel Prize winners, are too lazy to do that. So, so I thought, I'll do what Ronald Coase and Stephen Chung and these guys, you know, they, they could come up with some really good information, and good scholarship. So I'm going to do that. I'm not going to sit around and fiddle with mathematical equations my whole life and tell tall tales of market failure. Uh, I want to learn how markets actually work. Yeah. It reminds me, when I was in graduate school, by the way, I'll never forget, uh, uh, they brought it, they had a weekly seminar series and they brought in a, uh, a, a Princeton economist named uh, Professor Ung, N-G, his name, and he was a big shot mathematical microeconomist. And, and Professor Ung gave a presentation on the hamburger market, a model of the hamburger market. And so we all sat there and he, and he filled up a, no computerized math back then. He filled up a whole blackboard with equations and he taught, and um, one of my professors, Gordon Tullock, uh, at the end, uh, he said, uh, Professor Ung, this doesn't seem to be anything at all like the real hamburger market. And Professor Ung said, I'm not interested in the real hamburger market. I'm interested in my model. And, that's, and, that's, <laughs> and I, think, I think Paul Samuelson would have had the same attitude. Uh, J.E. Meade would have said the same kind of thing. Uh, and Paul David. That's, that's, that's another thing. that I mean, Maybe I should write that as item number six here. Well, I did put uh, fit, uh, ignoring reality on my, on my list here. Uh, of things to look. So anyway, how did we get the the the, um, the monopolies in telephone, natural gas, electricity, and so forth? Well, here's how. One of the things I found out is uh, when I was digging through the Johns Hopkins Library, uh, Richard T. Ely was uh, taught at Johns Hopkins for a while, and at the time, the you know early 20th century, late 19th century, he had written all these articles on electric utilities because it was a big issue. Of the day, so I found all these these uh, collections of articles by Richard T. Ely, among other people, and started reading them. And uh, here's how here's how um, it happened in Baltimore, because this I found this in the Johns Hopkins Library. It's about the history of the Gaslight Company of Baltimore, it, from its founding in 1816. It struggled with new competitors, and its response was to compete in the marketplace. And so, uh, so there was vigorous competition in the gaslight industry. And so uh, here's what the, the, an economist that Ely cited, his name is George T. Brown. I dug up George T. Brown, I, Richard T. Ely cited him. And he, lo and behold, he wrote a whole book about this. And he cites an 1851 editorial in the Baltimore Sun declaring that competition is the life of business, they said. And by 1880, there were three competing gas and light companies in Baltimore. Uh, and, uh, and so, but when Monopoly did appear, here's how it happened. 
1890, a bill was introduced into the Maryland legislature that called for an annual payment to the city from the Consolidated Gas Company of $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly. So in other words, uh, the city came along and said, well, you're struggling with all this competition, we know, uh, and, and so here's what we're proposing. We will give you a 25-year monopoly if you share the monopoly loot with us, the politicians. So it became a, a, a taxing scheme, basically, a way to tax uh, the consumers of the gaslight, eventually electricity, and so forth. That's how the natural monopolies came into being. Now, the story that there were monopolies being created in the free market and enlightened politicians came to the rescue with public interest regulation is a bunch of phooey. It's, 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 it never happened that way. And so once Baltimore showed the, showed the way, cities all over the place started to say, oh, yeah, that's a good way to extract more tax revenue. Not only that, that when you get your higher gas bill, the people won't even know it's because of the tax. They'll think it's the greedy capitalists who run the gas company that are gouging them. They won't, that's any better yet. And so once this happened, this, uh, I ran across another article by a man named, an economist named Horace Gray. And, uh, and he wrote about how once this happened, everybody uh, wanted in on the deal. He said, you know, uh, where's this list of uh, uh, businesses? You know, the, the dairy industry said, we're a natural monopoly. You know, they, every, everybody wanted to be declared a natural monopoly to be given a regulated monopoly. In fact, the entire New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt, the first two years of the New Deal, uh, was this. It was the creation of monopolies through the National Recovery Act and the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. And, uh, and so that's how those monopolies were all created. And that, of course, did nothing but make the Great Depression worse because they were restricting agricultural production and restricting um, manufacturing. And so that's another myth that I would argue, the, the, whole, the whole natural monopoly story. And uh, see, I have, uh, I have uh, two minutes left. Which one should I... I guess I'll end with uh, the socialist pollution story. I have a few others. I was going to talk about antitrust, predatory pricing, and asymmetric information. Maybe all I'll say about asymmetric information, maybe I'll say something about that instead is uh, uh, there's an article, I didn't put it on the list, uh, there's an article by uh, call, that talked about the lemons problem in economics. And the author was Bruce Ackerloff, who's the husband of Janet Yellen, uh, another uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. And the lemons problem, it was published in the American Economic Review in 1970, was uh, about the used car market. He's uh, in, a, in an asymmetric information. He said, car salesmen have a lot more information than the buyers do of used cars. And so they're much able to, uh, as a result, to sell us lemons or, you know, cars with problems in them because they have different information. It's asymmetric. It's not symmetrical information. And so therefore, he predicted that the used car market would probably disappear altogether because of this, because people couldn't trust uh, the, the car salesmen. Uh, although at the time he wrote this in 1970s, that, that problem had already been solved by product warranties. Uh, you know, if you buy a used car now, you, you, I don't think you can go anywhere in the United States now other than private, if you buy it from a private individual. But any company that sells used cars offers at least a seven-day warranty, or not, I mean, most of them a 30-day warranty, where you can take the car home, have it checked out by your mechanic, and if you see a, some kind of problem, you bring it back. CarMax is famous for for doing that, and that existed at the time. Uh, but uh, all I'll say about this is that this whole area of, you know, for which Joe Stiglitz won the Nobel Prize again, uh, is that it's all ass backwards, to use a scientific term, in my opinion, <laughs> because asymmetric information is another way of saying the division of labor and knowledge in society. It's another way of saying we all have different, we all specialize in something. You know, who knows more about how to manufacture a car, the car, automotive engineers or the car buyers? Who knows more about how to grow food and raise livestock, farmers and ranchers, or people who go to the grocery store and buy steak and, and vegetables? Uh, and and uh, who knows more about uh, manufacturing clothing, clothing manufacturers, or you when you go to the mall? We all have as asymmetric information is another way of saying the division of labor. And that's what makes markets work.
That's how markets work. And in fact, you know, Mises and Rothbard say it's, a, it's the thing that keeps civilization going is the international division of labor. But, uh, but somehow these MIT, Harvard slash Harvard economists have uh, managed to say that asymmetric information, they, they call it something else, they call it asymmetric information, is, a, is a, an example of market failure in our market success. Imagine what the economic world would be if we all knew the exact same thing. Why would anybody trade with anybody else if we all had the exact same knowledge and, and ability to produce, to, to produce things? There'd be no markets uh, in a situation like that. And so uh, I had another article of mine. It was on, uh, I call it the canard of asymmetric information as a source of market failure. It was in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. I think I put it on that, that list somewhere. Uh, I think my time is about up. The fun is over. And uh, in, in the, if, if you want to ask one or two questions, I'll take one or two questions. Uh, if not, it's kind of late, and we had you had your heavy uh, what was that fettuccine Alfredo for lunch? So it's probably nap time for a lot of you. And uh, uh, that, that's all we'll do then. We'll